the most hardworking kids out here today, isn't it? Everybody else is sleeping. I promise I'm late, not because I lost no week. I woke up at 4 a.m. It's because I, I thought it was actually faster to get to the hotel than I realized and it was traffic. So I got stuck in traffic. It was a period of time. So, all right, let's dive in. So yesterday, um, yesterday we spoke about this general idea that as we're starting to you know, build more decision support applications and are building models that are driving these decision support applications like recommendation systems or systems that allow here to models, we use these, you know, we need to think harder about the models we're training and basically what are the biases in the data set that it's learning and whether when we deploy these models in practice, whether these models will generalize or not, right? Or what are some, you know, what is the uh, quality of the resulting inferences that the uh, model is providing you? And uh, in particular, we spoke about several example applications and talked about reformulating the predictive question we were asking as training a what-if model as opposed to training an association, a model that just learns associations. Yes? Um, and then we learned about basically, you know, how, what are the challenges associated with learning these models from data? We learned a few simple tricks for estimating, uh, you know, in the took like the blood pressure exercise as a simple example and thought of what the corresponding what a question is. We learned a few tricks by estimating the corresponding model and the causal effects from data. Um, the slides that I'll post contain, will contain uh, tests on conductivity, conducting sensitivity analysis to the um, you know, choices we were making, but I didn't cover that. But the, uh, there will be references if you're curious. And then we discuss this notion of learning a potential of a model to be able to answer these water questions. And that's where we left off. Yes? So today we will demonstrate, so we'll you know, take this notion of potential of a model and so we'll study in a slightly more complicated domain. And so we'll start there. And then we will, and more broadly, I'll kind of motivate this idea of understanding understanding the quality of your model in terms of the uh, you know we leverage causality throughout but basically this idea of how confident can we be that a model can generalize from the environments which it, it, which really means understanding what about the parts of the data that you're learning that will persist as you move to a new environment versus what about parts of the data that you're learning that won't generalize, right? And that concept will repeatedly come um, in the techniques we'll teach you and then I'll sort of close with uh, sort of a bigger, broader, more open-ended direction that uh, kind of in an interesting area of follow-up work. Okay, and, uh, and so let's start with a few simple examples or a few examples of applying the above method. This is sort of the tricks we've uh, spoken about, about adjusting for bias in more complex decision making problems. And I'm leaving this in here not because I'm going to go through every one of these in detail, but just as sort of example papers you might be interested in reading if you're curious to learn more. So this particular one um, studies, you know, you have some existing, so we spoke about the application of recommendation systems, you want to make a recommendation. Um, treatment, so what is the corresponding treatment here? You're recommending a specific item. Of uh, item, outcome is if a user will click or not based on your recommendation. And then, you know, we spoke yesterday when we first started about your naive approach. Now you have a little bit more appreciation for what the challenge is. So in this case, why is it complex? Because recommendation typically formed, you know, using classical approaches that we would take, now we need to be modified by understanding that your data was generated using an existing here, you know, recommendation algorithm. So you need to adjust for whatever policy they were using for making recommendation. When you're trying to learn whether or not a user would have gotten exposed to a particular, and 
and then how that informs your model when you learn for a new user whether or not they would be, you know, whether, whether or not they're likely to pick a particular uh, idea. Does that make sense? Um, the second, uh, uh, second example here is an ad-based system. Here, the idea is should we expose this user to a particular app or not? And here, they basically similarly use. Um, and in doing so, one of the challenges in this particular application they're exploring is the fact that the world is constantly evolving. It's not that it's a static, stationary world, but you know, you have lots of rich historical data on a given user. You want to take advantage of that. But also, um, the decision-making context is continuously evolving because as you're collecting more data about the user, you, know, you, you want to continuously evolve what would be the right thing to show. And so this paper, again, is um, kind of exploring these concepts in the context of ad advertising. And then I'll dive a little bit deeper into this paper. So this paper um, goes back into the idea that we started yesterday, which is this notion of um, you have clinical data. You have, tempo, you have time series data of any kind. And in this case, you have repeated sequences. And that example application I spoke about, where you want to risk stratify patients to identify which patients are at risk for an adverse event or not. And the question is, how do we take temporal data to be able to answer these questions? Yeah. So this is sort of the application we've spoken about. You, you have your data, individuals coming in, reminder, you have historical data on this patient for the first, say, 24, 48 hours. You want to make a um, prediction. Or you want to stratify them into who are the ones who would benefit from aggressive treatment. We sort of spoke about classic thing to do would be to separate the people who had adverse event versus not, and then learn a predictive model, but the problem was that that doesn't give you reliable risk estimates, and why, and we spoke about why, and just to kind of drill the point in, because this is a brand new morning, it's 9.30, I want to make sure you drive this point home, and effectively you could be in a scenario where you have two different data sets, two different training environments, so two different training environments, you've taken data from the first 24 hours, you're trying to learn a predictive model, but the challenge is, you can easily be in a scenario where your populations are the same, you're not overfitting, you have enough data, your features make sense, but it's learning on the same patient, on a new patient, same patient, it gives completely two models trained on two different data sets where the only difference is practice patterns in these environments will give you two totally different answers. Right? So it's basically confusing where why should I get, you know, I'm using the same blood pressure, temperature, heart rate. I expect to learn a model that tells me, you know, these are innate factors about biology that should predict risk. It shouldn't depend on extraneous things in the environment. And so these should really be the same. And if it's not the same, then that's kind of discomforting. Yeah. under these different scenarios to 
deriving the solution on? How do we estimate this from data? Right? Yes? Okay, I'll pause questions. Because I'm going to build on this today, so I want to make sure everybody's comfortable and remembers the key ideas. So if you're getting if you have a new problem, you're sitting down, you're some you're now a machine learning expert, your colleagues come to you and they say, I have this new problem, I have this data set, and I want you to or help me forecast something, you know, whether or not to show this ad, or whether or not, you know, let's say you're working on, um, you know, financial application, or anything you can think through. What you want to do, the first thing you ask is this question of like, okay, if I build a model, what are you going to do with it? Okay. The, if I build a model, what are you going to do with it? So, in the example of Netflix, it was my model is going to forecast whether this user would like it or not. Why? Because my goal is to show that to a user so that they can now, you know, give me a rating, right? So the thing I was going to do with it was to prioritize which users to show what movie to, right? So you want to first figure out what are you going to do with it. So that's your action. As soon as you know what your action is, what your goal is, what is the thing you're trying to choose between, that's what goes here. So now you're saying, okay, if I do this versus I do that, how does that change the world? And that's the thing you really want to estimate. So effectively, start by asking the right question. And your right question, what you're formulating is figuring out what is the thing you're choosing between? And what is the thing that you care to forecast? What is the thing that, what is the outcome that matters to you after you've chosen? So this is the criteria based on which you're going to make a decision. So for example, in the hospital example, should I put them in the ICU or not? My criteria why is, is this person going to be healthy? Is this person going to recover? Are they going to fall sick if I don't? Right, so some way of quantifying physiologic state. This tells me, should I give them aggressive treatment or not? And this is your history, so now, Given your features, you're trying to see if I did this versus that, what is my outcome going to be, right? So the first thing you do is always start with the right question. Once you know what your question is, then this example, what we did was to say, how do we now go from this question to build the model? Because I don't know how to train this model yet. And in the blood pressure example, we went through it and said, okay, in the blood pressure example, using assumptions that we spoke about, positivity, consistency, and uh, no measured confounding, we can basically go from here to here. So what this does is basically goes from here to here, which says, I know that from no measured confounding, I, this is independent of A capital A equals A, so I can introduce that to the right side of the conditioning bar. And then, because of consistency, given that this A equals little a and little a is here, then from my data set I can just such that I call the cases where A equals little a and estimate this and these are the same. So effectively I went from asking the right questions, the assumptions under which I could then go from here to here. Right? So positivity, no one measured down in consistency, I could go from here to here. And now this you know how to estimate from data. Right? So only under some assumptions you could go from here to here. And those were pre-assumptions when you're graphing your data, when you're trying to model a problem, you will look at basically whether those assumptions hold. Right? So it's the corresponding version of these assumptions do they hold. And if they hold, then you know what you need to estimate. You can estimate it from data, and now you have basically what looks like a simulator, and you can simulate. Right? So now instead of doing that, you will do this. So far so good. Oh, so I'll show you what, what the corresponding question should be for this application. Yeah? For this particular one. Yeah. Yeah.
Does that make sense? So, it's, so don't, don't think of this as, oh, if I take this approach, it requires me to be very rigorous. And it requires me to understand these things. And it requires me to have very clean data sets. But there are other approaches where I don't need that. I can just take a data set and I can just run it and it will work. And basically my claim is that if you're, you know, depending on what you have in mind, I mean, the paradigm I'm describing is very general. Like, even if you use the most challenging regression models, at the end of the day, they're still training a model like this. So no matter what you do, you're going to suffer from all the issues I described last time. So there isn't a version of, um, you know, the only way you can get something that is has more guarantees or um, you know reliability, comfort, like comfort, you can get comfort that the resulting inferences are reliable, is when you basically now have a deep understanding of your data to understand what the data generating mechanism is. And what is and isn't violated. And so the more you know, the more comfortable you can be with the resulting inferences. If you know for a fact that there are things, you know, you don't know if the non energy contract presumption is not met, or you're not sure it's met, then you can basically test sensitivity to that assumption, right? You can basically think about, well, if this is true, then these are my inferences, but I'm not so sure if these assumptions hold, so I'm going to now violate these assumptions and see how my inference changes. Okay? So, and here, so, so first question here is that, for you, what am I going to train a model on? So what I want to train a model on is my first 48 hours, condition on my first 48 hours. What is my outcome going to be if I did nothing? That's an example quantity I can estimate. And if I did this, I could rank everybody using this. And now explicitly, I could rank them and see who are the people who are at most at risk of you know, mortality or most at risk of adverse event if I did nothing, and then those are the people I said on the ICU. Right? That seems like, and the more important thing is, if I did nothing means I'm controlling the way nothing here and throughout. Right? So I'm explicitly controlling. And in order for me to estimate this, it basically is asking that corresponding question. Find me people with this history on whom my intervention was going to be nothing and compute that outcome. Right? And you know, we spoke about numerous approaches, this is high dimensional data, so we were going to construct an outcome model. Questions at a level of detail at which data is not captured. 
right? So at that point, you have to ask much more abstract questions and much higher level questions and more noisy. You're going to get more noisy estimates, but of quantities that are of <coughs> more aggregate nature. And you will make decisions based on more questions of more aggregate nature, right? So if your goal is to estimate outcome in, in a minute-to-minute -minute level of like exactly what's happening with blood pressure, and you're doing all sorts of things, and you have no understanding of what those things are, and your hope is to be able to look at fluctuations in blood pressure and make it as um, you know a recommendation on treatment policy. That's a bad idea because you don't have you don't you can't possibly get those estimates reliably, right? So in other words, the question that you're asking should be informed by what is possible to estimate the data. Yeah. Say that one more time. So in this case, this is you're saying this is the wrong one. So here, what you were predicting is outcome adverse event or not, given history. And instead, what you should be doing is the what if question, which is what would the outcome be if I did X or if I did Y. Correct. Uh, well, you have ways of answering this question, and each one of these is, could be an alpha model from a single big model or multiple models. That depends on your choice, right? You have some way of estimating this, which we will talk about shortly. But then you basically, once you have a way of estimating it, this is the quantity you're using to determine, right? So an example would be if this given I do nothing, send them to a low level of care versus send them to a high level of care is very different, like my outcome is much better if I send them to a higher level of care, then I should do that. Yeah. Okay. So what is the corresponding, so in this example question, let's say you have data, so this is real data, and this is, let's say you have, you know, every time you came in to a clinic, you got measurements, these are the medications or actions you were given, and the question is, you know, you're at this point trying to make a decision about what to do. And you're asking questions like, well, what would be, so what's the corresponding question, right? So the corresponding question is, what is my potential outcome given history? So given history, what is my potential outcome if I did nothing? So that's this trajectory. Or what if I gave you one dose of this medication here, right? So it's given history, what if I gave you one dose of this medication here? Or what if I gave you two doses of this medication here? Yes? So that's the type of question you're looking to ask. So I'm actually going to skip that. And then, so now here's the thing you, so I'm going to give you a sequence of intuition. So the first thing we did yesterday was we spoke about this notion of, you know, BMI. And you have blood pressure. Right? And then you had exercise. Correct? This was a model yesterday. And then the, the thing we determined was how doctors prescribe. So the confounder here was BMI, right? And it was being used to both, it influences BP, but it was also being used to influence exercise. And then the important thing is in your data set, the, how BMI, how your BP influence is influenced by BMI and exercise is kind of the relationship that generalizes, right? It's a fundamental question about how your body reacts to exercise, you know, related to BMI. This choice, on the other hand, was human, man-made, right? Like somebody said, oh, based on what the BMI is, here's what my policy is going to be to prescribe exercise. So some doctor may say, I'm very inclined to provide exercise, some other doctor may say something else, right? So in other words, this relationship changes, but this is the fundamental truth we are trying to discover. Right? This generalizes across data sets. This may change. You agree? Okay, so let's look at this example. So now I'm going to look at a more comp like a sequential version of that example, where I have state action, state action, state action. This is like a you know classic discrete time model. Yeah. So what is the state? It's all the measurements, heart rate, blood pressure, etc., physiology. What's the action? I choose to give it medication or not, then state, it changed, obviously what I did change is state. Again, 
even whatever happens, again, and take some action. And then that becomes a state and so on and so forth, yeah. You can write almost most uh, time series domain problems using a simple model like this. It's an abstraction because it oversimplifies and I'll relax that. But for now, do you agree with this? A vigorous not? Okay. So then the important thing to think about here is that if we were sitting here, x1, let's say to, at 24, 48 hours, I'm sitting right here, and this is all my data, that's an x1. x1 is telling me what is the current state. Okay? And then I have a couple of choices I can make, and I want to know on the you know, time of discharge, what is the outcome going to be. So I'm going to try to estimate what x4 will be given x1. Okay? And then the important thing to know is in your historical data, people have done all sorts of things. Okay. And the choice across hospitals that changes is this notion of given A1, X1, what decision they take A2. Given X2 and A2 and all this other history, what decision they make here in A3. Right? So that particular thing is much more about like how people choose to practice. That can change from data set to data set. What is the part that we think doesn't change? The part we think that doesn't change is physiology. If these are the same types of patients, these arrows, the ones in green, encode human physiology. So if your you know, blood pressure is at say like 120 and I gave you a particular medication, that's my A2, how does that change my blood pressure? Right? That's physiology we hope change, generalizes. Yes? So now the main thing I'm trying to get you to realize is that you have a data set that parts of your data set that won't generalize and there are parts of your data that do generalize. And the parts that generalize are here in green and the parts that don't generalize are the ones in red. Okay. And so what we're going to do is just like here, we basically, so now let's do a one to one again. So if this was your source of confounding, you corrected for it. And you could learn this part, which is BP given BMI and exercise, in order to estimate how that changes. So in this domain, your confounders are what? You're being provided actions, so these are your actions. And your confounders are all of the things that are controlling it. Right? So it's everything that's being used to make these as like these action determination, what should be done. And in this example. And so effectively, in this, it's these variables. And for this, it's these variables. So if, as long as every single time I'm making an action, and the action is always determined by history and everything that in history that is observed, then I have my known measure confounding satisfied, correct? So effectively, the sequential corollary of this is if I have these, if I could write out my graph and I could say, you know, what are the things that generalize? These are the things I want to know. And in order to determine this, I need to control. I need to make sure that basically, so I'm going to learn these given this from data, and that's the only thing I need to learn. And then in general, you're basically trying to determine, like, effectively, can you, um, you know, like what are your covariates, um, like what are your sources of confounding and can you actually, uh, uh, do you have unmeasured confounding, no unmeasured confounding assumption matter or not? Yes? Okay, so in this case you do, and you basically are going to want to learn just the green parts, and the green parts are effectively x2 given x1, a1, a2, and x3 given x2, x1, a1, a2, a3, and so on and so forth. And if I can learn something like this, then I have what's the equivalent of the potential outcome model or simulator. How? Well, in your, in your observational data, you have your V of X, then you use somebody in that data set had a policy of choosing A. And then given a choice of A and X, you know how to generate Y. Because you have an outcome model for it. In a new environment, your outcome model generalizes by construction. You agree? So these parts of the green parts, they generalize. This is the part that you get to set. So for, a, for building a new simulator, you effectively are saying, I'm going to take these parts of my training data, this part is the one that I'm controlling, and based upon that, I can simulate. So for example, I could come up with a version where I say, 
I'm going to start at state X, which is simulated from my state of all possible patients starting points, which are the same across data sets, what this patient looks like. Then I'm going to choose what to do. And given that I chose what to do and where they were, I'm going to use this model to simulate the next step, state. Again, given that state, I'm going to choose what to do. Once I've chosen what to do, again, I use my outcome model to simulate what the next state is going to be. And I do a long sequence of these, um, and that gives me sort of a way to simulate what the outcomes, possible outcomes, would be for the sequence of actions that I am choosing. Does that make sense? Yeah?
How do you know what will and no one generalize? Yeah, based on your domain knowledge. So in this case, in this example, we know fundamentally the problem here is I want to understand blood pressure, how is that affected by BMI and exercise? Right? It, does that generalize across data sets? It should, if it's the same people. And that's why like fundamentally understanding what is the question you're asking and you know who are the people in your data and does this hold is very important. Similarly, in this case, we're saying, okay, I expect that the people in my hospitals are the same. I don't think that in one I'm representing one ethnicity and another I'm representing a totally different ethnicity, that they have no nothing in common. I expect that I should be able to learn how these people will react to these medications and procedures, and I expect that to generalize. If I know, you know, that's what I'm trying to learn, right? I'm trying to build a model of physiology. It's the purpose of this um, learning problem here from the data set. Yeah. We're not learning the policy. So the policy here is this. So policy in, in these scenarios means what's the way by you choose what action you take. So you won't learn the policy, what you're trying to learn is this. Yeah. And so your question is, is this too hard to learn? Well, I mean, you might have to practice that Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you still need to learn the policy. You, no, the factorization you don't need to learn, right? The factorization is basically something that's given you. Or the factorization is something you'll write out. Okay, sorry. I suppose it's um, in order to control for it, don't you have to understand the policy of the PSR? Yeah, so we don't, turns out I don't actually know, need to know how were they taking the data and what were these red arrows. Right. So similarly in this example, I didn't need to know how they were using BMI to prescribe exercise. I just needed to know that they were using something and the something they were using was observed and then I was okay. So in the same way here, I don't need to know what they're using and how they're using, I just need to know that the things they're using are all observed and it's all in the data. Okay, and more importantly, effectively what we are trying to avoid is the version where they're using, there's some U, some hidden variable that's controlling this and it's controlling this. Right, that would be the version of a U, some U, that would be some hidden confounder that's controlling the outcome and controlling this. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go, um, so now we're good, so, and that's the model we're learning for data. So now in this data set, just to exercise your morning muscles a little bit, now in reality in this data set, things will be a little bit harder. So let me just tell you how will I make it harder. So the harder part is, we went from this discrete time model, but in reality, it's not just the fact that it's discrete time. In reality, actors, like in data sets like this, it's not that people are getting measured on a grid. You know, people are getting measured when they're getting measured. It's, uh, you know, I see the data and say, ah, this person's sick, let me go make a measurement. Ah, I see the data and I'm like, maybe they, I'm getting worried, let me go give them some action, right? Give them a medication. So there are some additional choices here, the additional notions of randomness. And the randomness is not just in sort of, you know, what somebody's going to do, but when they do it, right? So why is this important? Because, look, when I'm thinking about my problem, I'm going to augment this graph. And in this graph, it's not just going to be this discrete graph. It's going to be A1. Based on all my history, I'm going to first choose a time variable that says when to act. And now the time variable, once I know when to act, then it's going to determine what to do and you know, what to do or what to measure. Right? So this graph now gets augmented. I won't actually show you the full graph because the full graph is a little bit more complicated and it's in the paper if you want to know, but intuitively you get the idea, right? So what I just did was an exercise by which I saw this and I'm saying, what are my additional things I need to think about? And now I'm saying, okay, I need to think about this timing. I'm going to add that to the graph. And now I need to decide if they're choosing when to act, I need to know how are they making that decision. Why? Because it's a source of confounding, right? If I'm choosing when to act, all the things that I'm using to drive that decision better be in the data. Because if it's not in the data, then I have some version of unmeasured confounding. 
Do you agree? So that's it. So it's the corresponding. So all I did was take the sequential version of this and I expanded it to incorporate further ideas. And so the idea here being that timing between measurements is irregular and random. And so times are, so are times between treatment and in the discrete time setting, we did not treat the timing as random. Now the timing is also random and the factors driving timing should now become additional sources of our additional potential confounders. So you have to now control, ask for them specifically. So confounding your variables that control when a measurement is made and what measurements are made. Great. So now, and so for, I'm not expecting you for the next several slides for you to fully get it. I just want you to get an intuition. And then if you want to know more, then you can go read it, okay? So basically now in this case, instead of having just YI and AI, I also have a timing variable. So basically, and now I'm going to posit a model that doesn't just think about state action in discrete time. I need to think also about events that are driving it, right? And so I'm essentially going to do that, and my potential outcome is now going to be, given history, tell me for a sequence of actions, what is my trajectory going to look like? What is the function going to look like, right? What's the distribution of the functions that describe my state? Yes? So that's the picture I drew for you in the beginning. And now, if you want, you can like go read up to understand exactly what I, you know, like you can bring build this model one way, but you can make it very elaborate, depending on your domain and you know how many variables you have and so on and so forth. But I'll give you a starting point. So basically, so this is only for people who are sort of very well steeped in this and are super curious, you know, model point processes. But most I'll give you a sort of a quick, quick glimpse on how we did it. So here we're going to use is what's called the mark point process. Um, and basically we assume that essentially a point means when there's an event, right? So we need to generate events. And so our events are going to be sort of a notion of did we measure an outcome or not? So it's like is blood pressure measured or not? Because blood pressure is regularly measured. And similarly, did we measure, did we give them a medication or not? Because we don't always do. So at any given event, you're always asking, did we measure something? Did we act? And then it, this tells you what was the action taken and what is the what is the value of the outcome. So the outcome here is blood pressure, for example. And then what is the value of the action we took? Action is like medication. Yeah? And now we need to build the model of this probability space. And again, don't get intimidated by this. This really isn't a big deal. When you know there's a step-by-step -step process by which you can go back and read it, you're just positing a model. So previously I posited a model. I learned BP given BMI and this. I'm giving you an example of pausing a model in a scenario where I have events and then particular observations at that event times. And here we're going to use all the fancy things we learned from Arthur yesterday on using Gaussian processes because I want functions and I want to put distributions over functions. And so here the function is what is my blood pressure over time? And in addition to functions, I also need events. So I'm going to use what's called a um, you know, a couple process where essentially you have Gaussian process that are describing continuous functions and then point process that's defining when the particular measurement times are. Yeah? And so this is saying probability of an event happening and this is saying given that an event has happened, what is the value that I observe? And, and now I have a probabilistic model. These individual, these individual items depend on history. And the question is, what does it depend on? It's basically what's going to affect whether you have confound, you have a confounding or not. Yeah. And now using that, you can write out a model, you can write out your assumptions, because once you have a graph, you can explicitly write out exactly what the corresponding assumptions are under which, because you know what are the factors driving it, so you can write out explicitly what should your assumptions be in order for it to be possible to keep your more measured confounding assumption. Yes? And if you do that, and then you effectively can estimate your potential outcome model, and you have something to work with. And I, the most important part of the experiments I'll go through it, and you'll see what I mean. Have different antibodies that would be measured, you 
know, all sorts of high dimensional omic data you might have. It would go in your covariates that are driving the mean function of the GP. Yeah. I can I can point you to some papers if you're curious. Um, okay, so recap. So we built some potential outcome model. I started with a claim by saying you should do this instead of doing the Y given S. Right? So what I'm going to do is quickly do an experiment for you that does the following. I'm going to generate first two data sets A and B. In A and B, everything else is the same. The patients are the same types of patients in my simulator. The only thing I'm changing between regimes A and B is the policy that how doctors are practicing. Right? So I'm just creating simulated data. People evolve in the same way. The way they react to medications is exactly the same. The only difference is how you know doctors chose to treat them. Okay? So that's the only difference between A and B. And in, in this data, we satisfy the assumptions that are necessary in order for me to be able to estimate the potential outcome model. Okay? And now I go to regime C. Regime C is a data set that I'm going to violate these assumptions. So I'm going to violate some of the assumptions that I said I needed in order to be able to estimate these models. And then the question that I'm going to ask is, if I train something in date regime A, how do I do in regime B? My expectation is I should, it shouldn't, because the only thing that changes is the sort of practice patterns. I want, some, I want to build something that was invariant to anything. So my performance shouldn't change, right? So whether I train in regime A or I train in regime B, the answer of the resulting model should be the same, correct? That's assuming my, my assumptions hold. But if I train in regime C, now the assumptions don't hold, so it's, you know, all hell breaks loose. I can't guarantee that that would be the case, right? So that's what I should expect. Do you agree? I don't see as many good responses as I would like. Okay. So, all right, so basically here I'm going to use some baseline model, which is basically I'm doing regression of the y given x kind. So I'm going to predict future function because using a sort of a standard GP. So you have your prediction y given x, your history. And then what I call the counterfactual GP because here we do ask the what if question. Um, and then the two that we will compare are these, right? These, this is the baseline and that's the model. And here's something, so first thing is, I'm training something in regime A and reporting in regime A. I'm training something in regime B, but reporting in regime A. So first thing you see is that you, the risk score, and what I'm saying is the output, the difference in the output that I've trained in my, regardless of the data set I train on my test set, my output shouldn't change, right? So this is telling me if my output changes. So the baseline GP, if I train in A and predict in A, output doesn't change. But if I train in B and predict in A, my output changes relative to what I would have gotten had I trained in A. But for the CGP, this is not true. For the CGP, this doesn't change, but this doesn't change either. Does that make sense? So the CGP outputs are actually stable. So you can perturb how people are practicing in the training environments, but the corresponding inference you're deriving is not stable. Susceptible to it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And and then what this is saying, and so now the next one is not as interesting, but still, like some skeptical reader might say, yeah, okay, your model is changing, but does that really change my decisions? Is are my decisions really the same? So here, what we're doing is just kind of comparing. If I had a ranking of patients. With respect to one model, does my ranking change? So sure, the predictions change, but it doesn't change in a meaningful way that it really makes any impact on decision making. So this is saying, do my predictions, does the ranking change? If I were going to choose one model to send somebody to the ICU, does my model change? And then saying, if I use this model, then it does change. So your decisions about who you might send to the ICU just changes based on this thing about what was in the data set that you didn't even know mattered. Right? Versus in this, it doesn't change. Okay, so then the next piece is that now I'm going to go to regime C, which is, um, so CGP is stable because this is relevant information which we want to be relevant to, invariant, so that's worth check. And now regime C is one where basically we now violated assumptions and note that CGP loses this property too. So the assumptions are quite important to think about. Right, because what happens when you unmeasured, when you violate the assumptions, you basically have this notion of information leakage. That means you're learning 
artifacts about this data set that you didn't fully control for. So now when you go to a new environment, you think you've only learned properties that generalize, but that's not true. You're basically, you have control for all the pieces adequately. Yes? Sorry? Yeah, the baseline is this model. Is the one that you, you used to doing, the Y given X. Okay? Okay, so classical global learning algorithm, your models that are not stable to shifts and policy changes. These are one types of shifts. Action selection mechanism changes in your training. Those don't generalize. We are going to be learned using this water objective. And in doing so, you understood deeply what was the assumptions you had assumed to be true or not true in your data, and then learn your or if, you know your outcome model based upon which you were making decisions. So far, so good. Okay. So, and I gave you one example. Now, if you're curious, you can go. You know, we made choices, so you can see how you know we built certain choices into our estimator in order to estimate this model. You can make it richer and richer, and there are lots of things you can do with it. Um, but I want to also give you some other examples. So, you know, this is a beautiful paper by um, some colleagues at Harvard in epidemiology where they're asking like this question of like, you know, how is the population risk of coronary heart disease going to change under a whole different bundle of interventions, right? It's like a policy question. They're asking at a public health population level, if I gave these different types of bundles of interventions differently, what would my, in my population coronary heart disease look like? And they basically do this thing of like building a potential outcome model and they're simulating outcomes under different bundles of interventions and they're basically running. So it's a nice paper because if, if you, each one of these will give you sort of a little bit more of a sense of how people are building these models and how they're using these models. And they conduct sensitivity analysis to understand, right? It's, it's actually like imagine simulating an entire population. You don't know. I mean, people do all sorts of things. But the question is, they're saying, well, have we taken into account all the course level characteristics that matter? So it's not that you need very, very detailed knowledge of every single thing in the graph. It's that you need all the sort of first order or most important things that are really influencing the you know key factors that are going to be modeling. Yeah. So 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 it's an interesting example. Here's another one, and this is um, by colleagues at Google, and this is using another clever way of modeling the potential outcome for for advertising. And you know, there's some interesting issues here of like um, you know, the fact that you basically need to estimate the counterfactual, and the counterfactual here is they take advantage of some like parallel signal that occurs that is unconfounded in order to be able to like use as their um, what the outcome would have been in the if if no if the app wouldn't have been displayed. So just examples to play with, and then this is a third one I put in in response to your question yesterday, which is here what we're doing is building a very rich potential outcome model where we have essentially very large numbers of physiologic signals, and then you have like these different types of treatment models that are you know both discrete and continuous, and the continuous treatments you know the dose vary over time, and here we're trying to model physiology jointly um, in terms of like you know, perhaps there are relationships across different signals, like these are related in some way and so on and so forth, in building these outcome models. And the richer and the more accurate your model is, the better your answers are going to be. Right? So there's no shortcut around it. So far so good. So I'm now going to move to topic, uh, sort of a next idea. Uh, how much time do I have? Oh, great, awesome, I'm doing better than yesterday. Um, okay, so now, essentially, so you understood this idea of parts of the distribution that generalizes, so I'm going to now move this idea further to sort of take this, um, you know, ask more broadly this question of, what if it wasn't just a sequence action pair, and what if, um, what if you were in a scenario where indeed BMI was unobserved, okay? In other words, you had a harder problem when you basically do have some notion of unmeasured contaminant. And if so, what are you going to do? And can you still do something, right? And maybe the something that you, you're able to do is not fully estimate the, you know, 
the total effect, but maybe you're able to still find something that is useful in order to help with decision making. So on purpose, I'm, uh, you know, so, so still kind of very much the frontiers of what is and isn't possible, so we'll talk about some of the ideas, yeah. Okay, so given a problem, can we identify which relationships generalize and are stable across the sets and which relationships change it and learn only the former? Right? That was the intuition we used for you building the potential of a model, but you could just take that intuition and directly attack it in almost any problem you think about. And then the previous work relied on certain assumptions. What if some of those assumptions were cool? Can you still do something? Okay. And then I want to like give you more examples of biases that exist in your data that are going to hurt you, that hurt generalization that we want to be thinking about. So let's take this very, very simple example of a problem where you have only four nodes in a graph. So your goal is to predict T. Okay, so you, again, it's going back to your standard prediction problem. Your goal is to predict some variable you thought about, or four cap, and it may not be a prediction problem, it could be a detection problem, right? Like it could be a classification. In other words, you're not trying to predict something way in the future, you're just trying to classify it right now. Yes? So it's a detection problem. So say your goal is to classify T, or predict T, or estimate T. And you have this graph where you have D, so let's take this for example and go a little deep dive. So D here is some risk factor like meningitis. And if you have meningitis, sorry, D is whether you smoke or not. D is whether you smoke or not, okay? And if you smoke, this is the probability with which you'll be given this particular intervention, which is a beta blocker, it's a medication. Okay, so if you smoke, some doctor may say, ah, the fact that you smoke, I'm less likely to give you a beta blocker. Other doctors may say, I don't, I don't take into account whether or not you're smoking to decide whether to give you a beta blocker. In other words, this, this is the example of BMI. This is that example, right? Up until now, we always assume BMI was observed. And this is that example that I'm trying to recreate for you. But I'm going to now show you cases where BMI may not be observed. So in this example, um, you know, D is smoking, C is whether or not you get a particular medication beta blocker, Y is your blood pressure, and then T is whether or not you have meningitis. So if you have meningitis, meningitis affects your blood pressure. I don't actually know if this is going to lead to, but I just made up an example. So you have meningitis, and meningitis actually affects your blood pressure. And then whether or not you have a beta blocker also affects your blood pressure. So the thing you're trying to do is the following. So I see your blood pressure, your blood pressure is really low. It turns out meningitis makes your blood pressure low. So if I see your blood pressure is really low, I should think, oh, maybe you're at risk for meningitis. Maybe you have meningitis, right? It's the thing that doctors often do. You see some symptom and you're trying to reverse engineer what's the cause. Agree? And here, the other thing to know is that, okay, you see your blood pressure and you're trying, oh, maybe you have meningitis because the blood pressure is low. But you may also, it's also possible you have a beta block and beta blocker decreases blood pressure. So perhaps it's not the meningitis, it's the blood beta blocker, right? So it's the explaining away. Yeah. And then in, so this is the core problem, but there was this confounding that you weren't unaware of. So somebody in the data set, you know, chose to give someone a beta blocker on or based on whether or not they smoked. And then smoking also affects your risk of meningitis. Okay. So far so good. Okay. So some of these mechanisms will be stable across environments. Which mechanism do you think will be stable? Exactly. This T to Y and C to Y, right? So these will be stable. And then what won't be stable? And it's possible D to T will also be stable, right? But T, D to C is not stable, right? So some of these mechanisms will be stable across other environments and others are unstable and more likely to change. Okay, so effect of, effect of beta blockers and meningitis on blood pressure is likely stable and falls for prescribing beta blockers to smokers, but this one is unstable. And a generalizable model should learn to predict using stable relationships because that's basically a model that will generalize, right? If you have unstable relationships that you know don't generalize by construction. So that's the main intuition here. We're, we're, the whole thrust and premise of the research is that if you can now think, rethink, and approach all of these prediction classification problems as 
I want to understand in my data set what part of my problem generalizes as I'm going from my training to my employment environment. And only learn those, and in purpose, don't learn anything that won't generalize, and I will get a stable model. Pretty intuitive. And so in this case, if basically I had to forecast T or estimate T, and I had C and Y, and let's say that the true graph in the data at D, if you know, actually D did affect this, then the first thing I want to take away from this slide is that if I learn a model for T given C, Y, which is what you would do, right? If somebody gave you T and C and Y, and they said build a model, you'd say, great, I want to predict T, so I'm going to learn an initial model of T given C, Y. Makes sense, reasonable thing to do. And you're going to do that, and basically it's going to learn something that second you move to a different data set, it won't work. And so the question is why? Let's investigate this graph. So you have, this is your model. So you have T given CY, and this is an unstable relationship. What happens when you condition on C and Y? It means it's learning every path of influence from these variables to T. Right? It wants to, in the training data, it's learning every path of influence that exists between the variables you condition on and T. So, let's think about what are your paths of influence. Let's start from C. You have a path of influence that is like this. Right? If Y is observed, Y is observed, then using the rules of deceleration, this is basically an active path. So, do you agree that there's an influence path here if Y is observed? If this isn't clear, I'll like draw it. Let me, let me draw it out for those of you who haven't done D7 before. Um, so, so if you have three nodes, there are four possible. So do you agree these are the four possible graphs for, that can be drawn if you have two edges between three nodes, yeah? And then the whole point is if you wanted to compute influence paths from this node to this node, now you just have to, I don't have enough time to prove it, so you're just going to have to believe me. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you what the truth is, and then the different time, you can look this up, this is provable. But if this is observed, so in the case where this is observed, this middle node is observed, this path is no longer active. In other words, this cannot influence this. Okay, similarly, if this is observed, this is just a flip of this, so if this is observed, this cannot influence this. Also here, if this is observed, this cannot influence this. But if this is observed, then this can influence this. If it's not observed, then this can't. Okay? So far so good. And so then, basically, the idea here is using these rules, if you give me a complicated graph, and you point to any two nodes on this graph, I'm going to write out, take a trail, I'm going to basically point from A to B, the set of all arrows, and write down a trail of this kind, and then I'll reason about them three at a time in order to determine using these rules whether that triad is blocked or not. And anything that blocks that path, like a triad that blocks a path, blocks the whole path, right? Because the influence will not be able to flow if something is blocked. So first of all, Yes? So what I did was effectively, so I can now use this to take, and I'm only going to use the simple rules there because I just have a four node graph, but if you had a complicated graph, then you could, you know, it's very simple, nothing intimidating. So you're just taking that rule and applying it on long paths. But here what you're going to do is, C to T, if Y is observed, are we blocked or not? Okay, raise your hand if you think we're blocked. If Y is observed, are we blocked? If Y is not observed, are we blocked? Raise your hand if you think if Y is not observed, are we blocked? Yeah. So this is the fourth rule, right? So this is the fourth rule there. It says if Y is not observed, we're blocked. But if Y is observed, we're no longer blocked. So what this is saying is Y is observed, because in your data you had C and Y you condition on it, so Y is observed, this influence path is on. And this influence path is also on because D is not observed. In order to block this influence path, I need D to be observed. You agree? Great. So what did I just say to you? If you learn a model, this model T given C comma Y, if D is unobserved, 
you're effectively learning in, through this influence, what are the influence factors, and this influence path contains this edge, which was unstable. So basically, by construction, the model you're going to learn is not stable. Right? So that's a big problem. So, okay, so the main key idea here is that now you know how to think about this. You can write out a graph and you can write down these paths. And so two active paths from C to T. One is stable, the other is not. Great, and the unstable path includes relationships that changes. And the question you want to know is, can I only learn something that's stable? How do I do that if D is not observed, right? So if D was observed, you could just condition on all three and you're fine. Because it will learn this, it will learn this, and it will learn this, but it won't learn this. you agree? So if C, D, and Y are all observed, this edge will never get learned because this path is blocked because of D. So you're still okay. Yes? Yes, exactly. So, so what this is saying is when you have a data set, the first rule of thumb is you want to go write out what are your variables and talk, build the model of what you think is happening. Even if it's not the perfect model, you should try to build the model. Like, I'm not saying build the model means learn a model. I'm saying on paper, write out a graph for what you believe the variables are and how they might be affecting each other. You have an understanding of what the data is. You have access to an expert or at least something that knows about the data and you can actually, you can start positing, right? I think this is true. And if you don't know for a fact something is true, then you can write out possible worlds, right? You can say, I think it could be this or this or this or this or this. But now you can reason across these possible worlds to see, okay, almost all of these, I totally believe this is not true. So I'm at least safe there. And here I'm less sure. So it's possible there'll be some leakage. I don't know. We'll see. Right? So you at least have some understanding of when, what you can and can't do. But you should. Basically, almost any problem I get, the first thing I do is, you know, I mean, I can always run some function somewhere. But if I'm actually going to solve a problem where my name is going to be written after it, and it's going to get deployed, and, you know, I'm at risk of endangering my employment, I want to know, what am I doing? Right? So I want to understand well, let's write out the problem we're trying to solve. Like, let me show me all the variables. Like, how are these related? What are, we, what are we trying to do? And so, yes, yeah, so that's key. So, okay, so now finally, so I'm going to give you, so first thing you understood was this idea that, you know, you want to learn stable relationships and you want to remove the unstable relationships. So the question is, well, how might you do that? Okay, and so now I'm giving you one candidate algorithm we walked through for doing that. So here's how we think about it. So first thing is, consider this notion of what's called a vulnerable variable. So a vulnerable variable is any variable from which there are unstable paths of influence to the variable we're predicting. So in a given data set, you can figure out, uh, you know, so step one is can you figure out who are, what are the vulnerable variables? And the point is if you condition on your vulnerable variable, you're bound to learn things that won't generalize. Right? So any prediction problem, think first about what are your vulnerable variables. Okay? And this gives you an algorithm for learning about vulnerable variables. I'll tell you intuitively what it is. You, you want to start from the prediction algorithm, go extend the paths of length 1, length 2, length 3, length 4, and sort of visit each node at a time. And what you're doing is as soon as you find, so when you're considering paths of length 1, these are your paths of length 1, paths of length 2 are length 2. Right? And as you're considering each path, you're applying that algorithm that I just spoke about there. You're analyzing three outs at a time and you're asking, is this path blocked? And if the path is blocked, that means, you know, all paths to this, if I basically am checking all paths of length 2, and I'm checking paths of length 2 end and C here, if basically none of my path, none of the paths leading to C contain unstable relationships, that means C is okay. If I find a path that contains an unstable relationship, I'm going to mark that variable as a vulnerable variable, right? And I do this with increasing paths or paths of increasing length. And as soon as I find in the end, you know, as soon as I find a path that leads to unstable paths to a variable, I declare it vulnerable and I remove it from the set. Sounds good? So I'm, I'm finding basically a conditioning, a safe conditioning set. So my safe conditioning set does not contain any vulnerable variables. 
So in other words, I'm first finding all these vulnerable variables, I'm taking all my predictive, so if all the features that you wanted to predict based on, that's your starting point. And then you're removing all the vulnerable variables. And I'm removing the vulnerable variables using this idea. Yes? So far so good. So now if you remove the vulnerable variables, one possible thing to do is to only consider whatever is left over and you would have a model and that should be stable. So that's already a better starting point than where you were. Now the model won't be perfect because ideally it's it's not just about only keeping the stable, it's not just about keeping the non-vulnerable variables, you want to extract as much information as you can, right? So when you're removing the vulnerable variables, like in this example, so let's look at this example. Um, in this case, if I take from T, I basically, is Y a vulnerable variable? Is Y a vulnerable variable? It is. It is. Why is it a vulnerable variable? Because there's a path here. If I if I have y, y basically is not blocked if d is not observed. Right? Do you agree with me? So the way to think about this is do you agree c is not a vulnerable c is a vulnerable variable? Why? Because of this. Yes? If c is a vulnerable variable, it means I cannot condition on c. So now c is being removed. So if C is being removed and D is unobserved, then do you agree this path exists? So Y is a vulnerable variable too. Which means in this example, which I very carefully chose, I basically have removed everything. D was never observed, C is vulnerable, Y is vulnerable. So this was just to give you one obvious example where, great, let me remove the vulnerable variables, but basically in the process you're also removing paths that actually do contain stable information. So what is that? Here it was this one, right? So there was stable information here. And sure, you got rid of this, but in the process you also got rid of this. So then the next intuition is, well, I could remove, I can keep all the non-vulnerable variables, that's safe to keep, but can I do better? Can I actually take my vulnerable variables and pull back again the information on the paths that were stable, as opposed to just moving them all to, you know, getting rid of all paths from them? Make sense? Okay, so that's basically what step two is going to be. So step one was constructing learned relationship between C and T. Um, let's see, uh, where are we? So I'm going to come back to this later. This is another example of bias that is actually quite present that you will you often miss. So intuition here is. So I jumped ahead a few slides. So intuition here was identify vulnerable variables, variables that contain active trails of T, where vulnerable well distribution of the long path may be perturbed across data sets. Okay. More broadly, we want to only learn influence along stable paths and remove influence beyond stable paths. How? I'm going to walk through you through one sketch of the algorithm. So given a graph, you can determine which components are stable and which are unstable. So first thing you do is this pick a conditioning set. So this conditioning set is essentially just giving you that path-based algorithm that says, let me first identify all the variables that are not vulnerable and only keep those. And in this graph, when I do that, that turns out to be the empty set. Z is empty. Then step two is I'm going to say, step two, the intuition is as follows. Can I augment my set by adding paths that are stable? And in order to do that, the particular trick we use here is we say, what we're going to do is to add new features. These new features have a particular property. They're well, what we call counterfactual variables. Once you have these new features, these new features actually allow you to block these unstable paths and keep the stable paths. Okay. So in this particular graph, here's my intuition of what a new feature is. So if variable t, variable has both. So let's go back to this example. The unstable path here was this. The stable path here was this. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a version of y where I'm going to intervene on c. So c is the variable that was unstable, vulnerable. I'm going to intervene on that vulnerable variable to create this version, which is the contractual of y, if I intervened. So this is a version of saying, what would my blood pressure be if I had given you a beta blocker? Or what would my blood pressure be if I didn't give you a beta blocker? I compute that contractual variable. If I can compute it, now this is observed. And I insert it here because I'm saying I'm going to fix it, I'm intervening on it, I'm fixing it here, and now y has its parent. Um, so this is the y that I compute, which is with um, contractual observed this beta blocker being given. 
and then this is beta blocker not present, and then this is what the y would be if beta blocker was present, right? So this is an additive response. So you agree that I can take my original graph, add this, and reconstruct this new graph. This was a little fast. Take your time, go back and read the paper. I just want you to get a high level intuition. So all it's doing is, I went from my starting feature set, I kept the features that were not vulnerable, I took the ones that are vulnerable, I drew the corresponding graph, and now I'm computing new features. These new features take advantage of these counterfactuals. And now these new features, when I add it back in, I can retain these paths that are stable. And so essentially in this graph, what this would mean is, previously I had okay to do, not okay to do, t given cy was not okay, but now I can do t given this new feature, and that's okay, and that's a stable model. And that in generalize. Questions? Yeah, once I add this new variable, then I will remove these. I, you know, essentially these still remain vulnerable, but I condition on that, and that particular one is not vulnerable. Okay, question? Yes. Yes. In that data set, I intervene on C. In order, and intervening on C means I compute the new feature, which is what the counterfactual of Y given C. And if I can estimate that for my data, then I put that into my model. I'm redrawing the equivalent data. And now in that DAC, based on the intuition I gave you, I'm only going to keep the stable paths. So my stable paths is that feature, from that feature T is stable, the rest is not stable. But I'm at least able to retain the information. And if I do this, effectively what I get here is this version of, um, I'm going to skip all this, and here's my experiment, and in my experiment what I do is I'm going to sample a whole bunch of data, and here what I need, uh, what, what I, I'm, I'm writing on top what models I use. So blue is the model where I do the naive thing. I'm predicting T given CY. And <clears throat> let me tell you what the data is. So this parameter here is that parameter on that edge C given D. Okay, and if I vary that parameter, the degree of confounding, as I'm varying, the degree of confounding is varying, right? So that parameter is near zero, it has very little effect, it's like that edge is in present. Um, not zero, like some new, uh, some, I have an assumption about what the parameter value is in the training data. If in my test data the parameter has the same value, then there's no notion of change. Right, as that parameter changes in my test data away from what it was in train, now I'm introducing more and more perturbation. Yes? Yes? So what this is saying is, in my training data I had to set of two, and in my test data as I move away from two, right, that parameter on that graph, so let me remind you. So this is what my graph was. This is T, this is um, C, this was D, and this is Y. And then the thing that I was changing is this edge. Okay, and what I'm changing here is that I'm changing the parameter that I use to parameterize this. As I'm moving away from the parameter value here, away from what was used in train, I'm now introducing data sets in a different environment, right? Like, I should expect generalization to fall apart. And so what I'm doing here now is that the ideal model is the one that D is observed. There's no confounding. So that's your performance in here. So this is stable. As you change W2, nothing, to, you expect this model to perform well and it continues to perform well, right? Error doesn't, error in your test data set doesn't increase. You agree? Okay, so that's good. And then the blue is what would have happened if you had, if D was missing and you didn't think of it to control for it and you were just doing T given CY, right? This is what blue, the blue model would have done. So the blue model, as you deviate away on either direction, it basically has increasing error, right? So this model is unstable because it's learned relationships that don't generalize and it's, and that's translating into error. On the other hand, this green model is the one where we basically did that adjustment. And the two things to observe here is one note that this model with now is stable because we, by construction, right? We basically, we're trying to only learn parts that don't, that aren't affected 
by this edge changing in your training data. And you see that effectively, you can see it mostly remains flat. And then second, there's going to be a little bit of a gap because there's obviously, you could only, you were only able to capture some part of the relationship, not the full relationship, right? If you actually have D, you have additional information that you just don't have if, you, if D is absent. And so that corresponds to this gap. Okay, so the question you might ask is, so first of all, this is really good, it's stable. And then the hard question that remains open is, well, is this optimal? Is this the best we can do? We might be able to push it even closer to the red. Right, when you're actually close, you've actually managed to learn something. The thing that you beat, by chance, happens to be very similar in your test environment, so that's why it's getting close, right? It's saying, in, you know, when you're, when by chance, your training environment is just like your test environment, then that information that you learned can actually help you, right? Okay, so I'm almost done. So basically what I did was give you an example of how, um, so changes in your mind can produce other biases uh, during learning, these biases cause the learning model to be unreliable, basically unstable to changes that you haven't anticipated up front or premeditated. And that can lead to potentially dangerous predictions, which is really challenging. So I think as we are tackling more and more you know, domains where we need to be able to be confident that we understand what the model is doing, these, these issues are important. We use knowledge of causal mechanisms to proactively identify new variables. So in this particular approach, we basically are saying we want to learn stable relationships want to learn unstable relationships. And we proposed uh, one particular way of thinking about it as an example. Um, and, uh, but you might have other ways, and I think that remains open question. And then I said I was going to come back to one slide later. Let's see if I have that slide. Where is it? This is the slide. So even something as simple as selection bias, right? So if you have your data, when you're seeing a data set, there's selection bias, right? Somebody chose what data to show you. And basically, there's shifts between what data somebody chose to show you versus what is seen in the test environment. That's an example of a bias that is almost probably always present at the interface. So an example of this would be in this graph, I add a selection variable. Turns out maybe people who have meningitis come to the hospital more often or people who have meningitis and are on beta blockers because they're sicker, they come to the hospital more often. So that's an example of T being on and C being on affecting your influence of S. S is this binary variable that says whether or not this patient is more likely to be present in my data set. And so in your training data set, S equals one means that the example is present. And this is saying people of this particular T, C, T and C values are affecting S, right? And then what this is saying is this is another example of like a type of bias. In reality, you never draw this S variable, right? Because you don't think about it. But for any given data set, you can draw the S variable and you might imagine what are some biases that might exist in terms of what influences S. And if this is true, and then you're trying to generalize to an environment where S can be perturbed, where S may be different, now you suddenly again have this issue of things that might change that you might have to think about. And so this whole machinery I just spoke about, but again, you would use the same ideas to reason about it. Okay, with that, I think I am done. Conclusions, big picture. We can frame generalization in terms of differences in the data generating process across environments, naively assuming train and test distribution that our IID can lead to unreliable models and bias data analysis using knowledge of the data generating process, that is the causal bag, allows us to we incorporate domain knowledge and reason about the world, and we can identify what changes across environments we expect our models to be invariant to, and then train models to be invariant to these. Right, that's kind of the key ideas. And with that, um, I think that's it. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's possible that TC the buy is still like the best thing to do. If, um, yeah, like I think again you reason about it, right? So basically, if you think it's not going to be very different, then learning that information will actually, you know, the leakage is actually helpful. There are no more questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker again and let's go to the